Hello everyone, bringing you a video today uh, which sort of fits in with the videos I've recently uploaded looking at the introduction of things, so the Royal Navy's action working dress, the British Army's combat uniform, uh, and what we're going to be talking about today is the British Army's CB suit, which is the progenitor of the MBC suit. Uh, and the CB suit itself is a, a relic from the 1960s, was used into the 1970s uh, in training, um, but it was it, fairly soon uh, replaced with the, the initial issues of the MVC suit, um, the uh, number one uh, Mark II, if I remember correctly. Um, I think that's what the, the uh, nomenclature changed to, but that's a topic for another video going forward. What we have here is the smock and the separate hood from the CB suit, but before we get into the details of talking about this on the mannequin and looking at the trousers and so forth out of the packaging, I'll show you what these look like when they come in their primary packaging. Okay, so we're just going to take a look at the various items in the packaging. And the first item we'll take a look at is the, the most interesting bit of this, which differs from, from later types of this suit, uh, which is the, the hood, or as it's officially called here, protector head and neck. And you can see uh, chemical and biological size two. And then we have the contract number under here, the manufacturer, which is Remploy. And then the pack, and there should be a packing date here, packed with a packing date there. And you can see primary and it would say standard pack there it's just been folded over um, this as I say should have a date here but it's not clear but this is the little packet that the hood came in um, as I say normally you'd only have two packets uh, later on with this, the MVC suit of course because the smock had the hood or protector head and neck uh, as part of the actual smock itself but in this instance it's a separate part so you need a third little package to uh, to hold it the next thing we'll look at here is the smock, and this is obviously in the primary standard pack, and it's then vacuum packed inside um, the outer packaging. Uh, and you can see a smock chemical and biological protective part of, and then we have the code for the, the whole suit as an ensemble. Um, and this is size medium, uh, and you can see here the uh, contract number there, and again, Remploy packed. And we do actually have a date here, which is September 1967. Now, in terms of dates, um, the suit is mentioned in a 1965 chemical, and biological and nuclear warfare training pamphlet. Uh, whether it was actually around at this time or it's making mention of it before its introduction is not entirely clear, but, but certainly mid to late 1960s is the time these first turn up. And they would be very rapidly uh, superseded for actual use in the field in an actual chemical environment or nuclear or biological environment by the MBC suit, but they would be retained for training. And it's important to note that you actually see a nomenclature change because of that. We have another smock here, and this is quite a late production in September 1969. The MBC suit, the number one Mark II MBC suit, was already uh, coming into production or about to be introduced into production around this time. So we've had a change of nomenclature to say suit CB only, whereas previously it just said suit CB. So this is because you need the, the head and neck protector, the hood, to complete this. So you couldn't issue a pair of the new number one Mark II trousers and just a smock from this set because obviously you'd end up unwrapping everything and you'd only have the smock with no hood. Um, so that's a differentiation there. It cannot be used, this cannot be issued in place of the number one Mark II MBC smock, because obviously there's no hood. You, you, you have to issue it with the uh, head and neck protector as well, otherwise it doesn't serve its function. So that's interesting to note. I believe that's why this uh, was introduced. And obviously we're getting Remploy, we have all the details there as we had before. Um, but just a slight variation in the labelling there that I thought was interesting and it shows obviously the crossover period where the, the MBC suit was being introduced but these were being retained certainly for training purposes um, because they, they did offer a, a useful training aid in that regard even if they're not the best for in the field obviously the, the attached hood, the permanently attached hood is a much better design. And of course the final thing we're going to look at here are the trousers from the suit uh, and again these are in the, the plastic packaging and everything here primary standard pack as you can see and they're labeled trousers uh, chemical and biological protective suit cb as you can see there and that's part of the stock number and suit cb size medium again the uh the, interestingly we have may 1968 and then 1968 stamped again so obviously this is a slightly different label where the 68 is actually printed and you're supposed to just uh print stamp the uh month there but obviously it's been been stamped uh, with the, with the year included in the stamp uh, and again remploy the manufacturer there um but as i say that's they look very similar to the later mbc um packages that you would receive with the mbc suit in um this is where that sort of initial uh, vacuum packing and everything to keep these fresh uh to make sure that obviously the charcoal isn't reacting with uh, the chemicals in the air uh, that's where this in, uh, originates with is with the cb suit so the primary detail by which this differs from the later 
well, the Mark II MDC suit, which took over from this, and subsequent designs is the fact it has a separate hood. Visually, it's very similar to the Mark II in the grey and green here. The Mark III would go on to be made in plain green, and then also in DPM. And then you'd have the various marks after that made in, in DPM, Desert DPM, MTP, uh, and even in other camouflage colours for other countries when they were manuf manufactured from other countries. But both the CB suit and the Mark II both have this grey-green um, finish to them, a mix of sort of patchy grey and green cloth. But the major, dif the major point of uh, differentiation from the Mark II um, is the hood, which is of course a separate piece, as you can see here, it just lifts off. And it fastens around the neck there with a piece of uh, Velcro uh, and a tab here, which makes these easier to manipulate when you're wearing gloves. Open that up there, you can see the detail inside. The green lining material, you have a piece of elastic here, which I believe is to hook under the chin. Um, and obviously this would then, obviously you'd be wearing either eye shields or the respirator, depending on the threat level. And you have the label at the back there, which we'll have a look at in detail now. Uh, but that is the hood. Uh, and as you can see, this folds down neatly. It's been heavily compressed when inside the vacuum packing as we've seen previously so obviously it still has all the creases and everything from that and most of the time I do keep this folded away stored away uh, it's not a bit of kit that comes out very often um, you can see it's stamped there is a, a stamp here as well we'll have a look at the label and the stamp in more detail now here we have the label for the the hood and what it actually of course is called is the protectors head and neck CB and then beneath that you have the NATO stock number and then size one uh, and then the contract number underneath that um, as you can clearly see there. So that's the hood from the suit. I'll actually put this to one side now and we'll talk about the smock separately. So this is the smock from the suit uh, and as you can see um, we've got an opening down halfway down the front here and this again is closed with velcro as you can see there opens up and you can see the black the charcoal lining in there um, the black of the charcoal lining again with these pieces of tape to make it easier to manipulate when wearing gloves. You've actually got a, a paper tag here, uh, which gives the size and everything, which we'll have a look at in more detail in a moment. Um, also have adjustment tabs down the bottom here, uh, as I say, with again, with the, the tapes to allow them to be easily cinched in when wearing gloves, easy to manipulate. Uh, we'll move this around now and we'll have a look at the details. On the left hand side here, you can see we have the cuff cinched in. Uh, and again, that's done with Velcro. Um, or I think touch and close would have been the official terminology at the time. Uh, but anyway, Velcro, what we now know as Velcro, uh, again with the tab there, so that can be used to cinch the, the, cut, the uh, cuff in. At the back here, you can see more of this panelling, and we've got the sort of the green cloth seems to have been worked over areas of, of harder wear, so you've got it here on the, on the arms, um, and then obviously over the shoulders here where your webbing is going to bear. And that's one thing to note with this, is your webbing will be worn over it, so of course 1958 pattern cotton webbing, there's no way you're going to be able to decontaminate it, but this at least keeps you, you yourself, um, uh, relatively safe uh, certainly gives you uh, more protection than nothing so uh, that's the back of the uh, smock there anyway moving this round to look at the right here you can see the arm again there um, nothing different to look at on this side apart from as I say the paper label which remains up in the collar here uh, from when I opened it so as I say that is the the smock there so we'll look at the smock turned inside out now uh, and what you can see is the charcoal lining in here probably just a sea of black to you, but hopefully you can see the seam lines and the construction, details of construction there. Obviously you have the opening down the front here with the Velcro, as you can see the reverse of that there, uh, just halfway down the front to make it easier and uh, to take on and off over the head. Uh, we'll move this around now and have a look at the back. There's not really anything to see on the, on the sleeves in terms of detail. We'll have a look at the back though. The back here you can see more details of the construction and we also have the label up in the collar here, which we'll have a look at in detail in just a moment, but it's the, basically gives the size and the contract number and so forth up there. Here we have the smock label and you can see this is clearly labeled suit CB smock and then beneath that you have the source code uh, and then you have size medium uh, the manufacturer which is F Fryer and Company Limited and beneath that the contract number. And you can see here the paper tag in the collar which reads medium and then gives a series of numbers and I believe this is just a manufacturer's tag. So here we have the trousers from the suit and obviously these are made in different sizes but there is provision for quite a lot of adjustment with the velcro there and this is the damage I was talking about earlier this velcro tab here is nearly in, entirely gnawed through I think there's also damage down on one of the that you see on the leg here uh, and this is obviously one of the packages that uh, vermin have got at there's a, a bit up here as well but it's fine I can always replace that bit of velcro if I need to um, they're a very uh, simple design obviously with the lining uh, charcoal lining again which we'll look at in just a minute um, and the way they're supported uh, is actually by cloth braces just to lift them up there you can see the full extent of the green down the front there and then the gray down below 
you can you can adjust the legs in there are two velcro tabs there at the bottom hopefully you can see that two velcro tabs at the bottom which allow the the uh, legs to be cinched in uh, and obviously you've got the label up in the, the waist there which i'll have a look at in detail in just a minute but first of all we'll have a look at the inside of these there's not a lot to see in the inside really you can see in the center here we have this large section which is obviously folds in when you adjust the waist in um, so that that folds in like that when you adjust the waist um, you can see here the, uh, the the tapes coming round, and this is what the braces tie onto. So that you'll see in a minute when we turn these round, it's a little easier to see when they're inside out. Uh, you've got cloth braces which basically come down and just tie onto loops on the front. Here you can see they're fully lined all the way down uh, with charcoal. Uh, we'll turn these round now, and we can have a look at the, the back of them. Here at the back, you can see the label again, and as I say, we'll have a look at that in detail in a moment. At the back here, you can see the the cloth braces. These are just tape, worsted tape, sewn together at the back here. These would loop over the shoulders and just tie off to loops at the front there, which actually I should have shown you when we had them the other way out. There are just loops here in the front. So they just loop over the shoulder and you tie them around those to support the trousers. So a lot of uh, adjustment there. But that's the, uh, that's the trousers from the suit. We'll have a look at the label now. Here we have the label from the trousers. And as you can see, they're clearly labeled suits, CB trousers. Uh, the stock code beneath that, along with the size, again, size medium. And underneath that, we have the contract number, again, conveniently labeled. So a couple of other items I'll talk about just before we finish. Um, we have here uh, both uh, outer and uh, inner gloves uh, here, as you can see uh, in their packaging. These are both dated, um, well, this, these are dated 1967, as you can see, and they are uh, gloves, chemical and biological size nine. Uh, you can see the, the contract number underneath there. These are actually uh, REF issue. You can see they have a 22, 23B prefix to the stores code. Uh, and 23B represents uh, anti-gas clothing or chemical protective clothing. Um, I imagine the, the nomenclature on that uh, changed, but I know it as anti-gas clothing, obviously from more from a second war context, but that's what the 23B stands for. Uh, and obviously we have the date printed there. And then obviously these weren't worn on their own. They had an inner set of cotton gloves, which we have here. Now these are much later um, and they're 1976. I don't have a 60s dated pair of these in the packet, um, but we have again a 23B uh, prefix here which would obviously show RAF use um, or, or certainly that's the RAF prefix uh, for anti-gas clothing contract number there again and these are now have to change to the MBC uh, nomenclature as you can see by the 70s obviously we've moved on to MBC so gloves inner for use with gloves MBC presumably originally it would have been gloves uh, inner for use with gloves CB uh, chemical biological protective um, so yes, that's the two, and obviously the, you can hopefully see the details there. This is the package they came in, obviously notch in the end there, to allow these to be torn open, uh, much as we have on the uh, the other pack of gloves as well. So unfortunately, as I say, don't have a, pair, a pack of the uh, 60s inner gloves, but I do have a pair here out of the packaging, and you can see there a, a white cotton, um, a white cotton, uh, very simple, uh, just to give you an insulating layer on the inside. And if we turn these inside out, you can see hopefully there, uh, we have a 1969 date, um, and then the contract number and so forth. Gloves C and B, so glove uh, C and B, uh, and then we've got the code underneath, but it's all a bit faded there. But uh, that is uh, a pair, 60s dated pair of the inner gloves. And then we have here the outer gloves. Uh, these again are just black rubber gloves, you can see here, the tread pattern on the, or grip pattern rather, on the uh, the palm and the fingers there. This does vary a little bit. Um, these have, these are Dunlop made. Um, you have the Dunlop arrow and D uh, moulded into the wrist there. And we actually have the size moulded in as well on these. Often it's printed, but the nine and a half it is printed on this side as well. And they're dated November 1968. The rest of the stamp there isn't clear, but there's a 1968 dated pair there. And you can see, hopefully, there the detail of that. Um, so yeah, that's the gloves that go with the, si uh, the suit, essentially, um, to complete the look at this uh, in terms of protection. The gloves have been around certainly for a while. Whether they've been worn with inners prior to the 60s, I don't know. Uh, but certainly, you see photographs from the 50s of men wearing men wearing denims and rubber boots, uh, and they're wearing black rubber gloves uh, in the photographs of chemical troops and so forth. Something to note on that, and I've mentioned this in the video, we were talking about uh, Wellington boots, rubber Wellington boots. The RAF at this time period in the manual, in the 60s manual I've mentioned previously, 
were it was specified they would wear rubber boots because they were still wearing leather soled often wearing leather soled boots at the time the british army of course is transitioning to the dms boot and it's dms boots which are specified to be worn by the army which indicates there wasn't a protective boot at this time period now as far as i can tell from my research to this point um and my knowledge of this to this point is that the uh, boots number one mark ii are introduced as part of the suit number one mark ii which is the, the successor to the cb suit so i believe the boots the initial issue of mbc boots are introduced in the early very early 70s alongside the mbc suit and up to that point there is suggestion made of protecting boots with sacking uh, and obviously wearing rubber sole or rubber boots as opposed to any, something where the sole is going to soak up um, chemical agents and so forth so uh, obviously that's something that's come up when talking about the cb suit because it doesn't appear to be a, a pair of cb boots to go with it uh, and as far as i can tell at the moment there weren't you wore your normal footwear that's certainly what I've uh, done when when wearing the suit uh, at uh, events and so forth, because it, it certainly that is specified in the manual for the mid 1960s, and there doesn't appear to have been any boot come out uh, in the intervening time between that and the M introduction of the MBC suit proper uh, with the number one Mark II. So that's just a little detail on the boots one with this as well. So that is a look at the CB suit. Um, obviously, the progenitor of the MBC suit. Um, obviously initially primarily intended for chemical and biological warfare, although it was uh, specified that it would be worn under nuclear attack as well. Um, obviously that was the, the utility of it was heightened by having the, the integral hood added to the MBC suit, the, uh, the Mark II. Um, but an interesting thing to look at, I think, uh, not particularly common to find, um, but it's interesting to see Britain sort of taking a step towards protective clothing and so forth in the 1960s when very little had been done before. Uh, and I think it was realised very little had been done before and obviously it was necessary if troops were expected, um, heaven forbid, to fight on a nuclear battlefield or indeed with you know, the chemical weapon attack, then modern protective clothing was necessary. And this was the initial answer uh, before further developments were made. So I do hope you found that interesting, as I always say. Um, if you do and you'd like to see more from the channel, then please do consider subscribing if you haven't already. Uh, and when you, whether you're newly subscribing or you've already subscribed, do make sure you've selected uh, to be notified when I upload future videos using the little bell icon next to the subscribe button down below. If you really like my content and you'd like to support the channel, you can do. There is both a Patreon and a PayPal link down below. Thank you very much to everyone who supports me through those two methods. It really is greatly appreciated. Um, there is, of course, also the social media. There's Twitter, Facebook and Instagram all linked down below should you wish to keep up with what's going on on the channel on social media. And there's also an email address as well. If you don't really use social media and you want to make contact, there's that option too. Uh, but that's everything I wanted to cover in this video. So until next time, bye for now.